Hello, this is Michael Frank, and welcome to day three of the CCC workshop on reversible computing. And today's session will be on topics in computer architecture and other topics. Um, my talk to kick off the session is going to focus on uh, architectural, algorithmic, and mostly systems engineering related issues for reversible computing. Uh, just to brief look at the schedule, um, we have a bunch of plenary talks this morning because there's a lot of material stuffed into this day. Then we have a Q&A session as usual before the lunch break. And then in the afternoon, we're going to have two simultaneous breakout sessions for uh, computer architecture related and other high level topics. And then the next two days will be working meetings for full participants. So uh, my talk today, as I said, will focus sort of uh, scaling related issues, uh, but I'll also say a little bit about higher level topics like algorithm, algorithmic, architectural, and programming language issues. So the structure of this talk is it's going to start off by presenting the basic economic and systems engineering framework, which is kind of critical for the usefulness of this entire field. Um, and then I'll briefly re review some of the results in classical computational complexity theory for reversible computing. And then I'll explain why the entire traditional theory of computational complexity is really uh, the wrong tool for um, evaluating future computing technologies. And we really need a theory that's more based on physics. And so I'll talk about that a little bit and explain why if you take physical constraints into account, you actually find real scaling advantages for reversible computing um, that you would not notice in traditional uh, complexity theory. So, um, then I'll re briefly review a few aspects of reversible architectures and languages and um, highlight some of the, uh, the needs in this area. All right. Again, we're starting with the high level uh, framework from a perspective of economics and systems engineering. Um, and this discussion starts with a consideration of efficiency which we can characterize in general as a ratio between some useful product that is produced by a process. So this can be useful computational work that's performed and resources consumed. And this could be any kind of resources, but we imagine expressing those in some common cost units such as dollars or could be, everything could be reduced to equivalent uh, energy amounts um, with the same dollar value. So, uh, and then total cost can be broken down into a sum of cost to manufacture and deploy the system initially, and then the cost to operate it over its useful lifetime. Well, operation costs tend to be heavily dominated by energy related costs. So this could include the cost of the energy itself and also uh, the cost of operating whatever supporting infrastructure is needed to uh, deliver that energy to the machine and remove the waste heat that's produced. So if we then take the efficiency formula, we can reduce the numerator and denominator to the point where we're talking about per fundamental unit of computational work. So per operation at some level and they have the corresponding cost down here. So we have two terms, one for the energy related cost that includes this coefficient uh, per unit energy dissipated. And then we have the uh, manufacturing related costs, which can be expressed in terms of the delay of a particular device operation times the cost to manufacture that device amortized over uh, that amount of time, right? So uh, the interesting thing is you can see from the structure of this expression, that if you only reduce one of the terms in the denominator, you asymptote out to a point where uh, the overall value of the expression is just dominated by the other term. So this means there are diminishing returns from advancing computing if you only 
attack the either the time delay, the speed of the devices, and their cost to manufacture them. Uh, but you don't also reduce the energy related costs, which, you know, if the cost per joule is, we can imagine is fixed, uh, that requires reducing energy dissipation per operation. So in other words, all non-reversible technologies are ultimately a dead end. They're going to asymptote out to the point where the overall real world economic cost of computing is no longer improving uh, once we get to the point that this term is insignificant compared to the other term. And we're already starting to see this happen. Computing is, uh, performance is starting to become more and more heavily dominated by power constraints um, rather than by cost. And that's why we have so much dark silicon today. So transistors we can manufacture but can't engage usefully during operation. Uh, notice, however, if you reduce both of these terms in the denominator by a factor of n, say, then you in increase all efficiency by a factor of n. So that's a desirable thing to reduce energy dissipation commensurately with, um, you know, manufacturing related cost and hardware efficiency. Uh, one metric that is often traditionally used is energy delay product. And in fact, you can factor that out of this expression, uh, but it's not the entire expression. So what that means is that uh, reducing the energy delay product is often a win, but not always. So if you have a situation where uh, your costs are already heavily energy dominated, then even if energy delay product is increased somewhat, uh, it could still be an overall win economically if you reduce the um, energy term expression substantially. Uh, one thing that's always advantageous, um, if costs are fixed, at least per device, uh, is if you re reduce energy dissipation as a function of the delay value uh, for any given delay value. And so you're advancing the sort of Pareto frontier of points in the energy delay space for your technology, and that's always going to be advantageous, um, at least at a given device cost level. All right, so now let's briefly review classic complexity theory results. Um, and again, keep in mind that these are in general ignoring physical constraints, but they, they start to give you some idea of uh, what the algorithmic overheads of reversible are. So Bennett had his classic result that, you know, you get any computation reversible just by saving any information that would otherwise have been erased, uh, copying your desired output reversibly, and then undoing that entire first part of the computation, which will decompute all of this temporary information that was stored. But there's this storage cost associated with that, and so it inc increases the space complexity uh, of computations if you do things that way. But he improved on this result in 1989 with this more sophisticated algorithm that does this sort of hierarchical recursive decomposition of a given computation into segments. And uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, if you optimize this algorithm, uh, you find that it has um, an overhead that uh, is less than that of the original algorithm. It's by this polynomial factor, basically. Um, still not exactly the same space and time complexity as a irreversible computation. Uh, there was an interesting result from Lange, McKenzie, and Tapp in 1997, where they showed you could compute reversibly with no space overhead uh, using this algorithm that kind of explores the tree of possible predecessor states. Uh, the only problem is that it's got worst case exponential time complexity, right? So this raised the question, could you do things in the same space and time complexity reversibly? And uh, Josie and Ammer and, uh, showed in 1997 that if you uh, in an Oracle model where you have a, a reversible black box function that is being used as a uh, subroutine in your computation, uh, you can prove actually rigorously that there are uh, some problems for which uh, they do require more, either more space or time complexity to do reversibly. So uh, this seems to imply that overheads 
algorithmic overheads for reversible computing are inevitable. Um, one more result to note uh, is that if you parallelize the Bennett algorithm up here, you can actually improve its uh, space-time efficiency. Uh, so we're going to uh, refer to that a little later. All right. Now, why is are these results from traditional complexity misleading? Well, it's because traditional complexity theory completely ignores uh, fundamental physical constraints on computation, and these include the speed of light limit, various limits on information density, you know, bits per unit volume. Uh, these imply limits uh, such as on communication latencies, limits on information flux density, you know, across the surface. And, uh, and then together with Landauer's principle, this tells you irreversible computation produces entropy, which can't be destroyed. And you have to get it outside the surface of your computer because it can't build up inside indefinitely due to the information density limits. And so all these together you find yield there are real scaling advantages from doing things reversibly that are not captured at all by traditional complexity theory. So uh, it's really necessary to, to create a new version of complexity theory that takes physical constraints into account. And I uh, did this uh, in my dissertation work at MIT in uh, the late 90s. So uh, just overview some key results from that um, and I'm not going to give the full proof details for lack of time but uh, you know even if you only assume adiabatic scaling of dissipation with delay and that uh, things like leakage can be made as low as needed uh, you find that the performance of reversible machines per unit power consumption or per unit area is unboundedly greater than irreversible machines. And in terms of the scaling, uh, essentially as the size of the machine scales up with D, uh, some diameter value, then this performance boost you get scales up with the square root of D. And uh, that result neglects the algorithmic overheads, but we'll see in a minute that even when you take those into account, you can still show an advantage. Um, and uh, also in my dissertation, I showed that even if you ignore the cost of energy and you just um, pay attention to communication constraints, you find that there are still performance advantages for reversible computing per unit mass, right? If we assume some fixed minimum mass per device. Um, and these are small polynomial factors, but it's interesting to note that, you know, these are advantages that exist no matter what the architecture of the irreversible machine is. It could use any possible, physically possible, irreversible technology. And, um, and even if the energy is free and the only constraint comes from the communication needs of the application. So, um, you know, even if we were to find a source of essentially free energy, this shows that reversible computing still beats irreversible. So I thought that was an important result. All right, uh, just I'm not gonna go through every detail of this, but this is the argument for the earlier result, the simple one about scaling per unit area uh, with the diameter of the machine. And the key assumptions there are just that there is some bounded maximum entropy flux uh, which is going to depend on our cooling technology, but uh, for any given cooling technology, it's going to be finite. And it's assuming, again, the classic adiabatic scaling where dissipation is inversely proportional to the time taken uh, per device operation. And it's just a little algebra can show that uh, the rate of operations per unit area scales up with the square root of the depth or diameter of the of the machine. And so reversible machines will always be irreversible ones uh, above a certain scale of uh, machine size. Um, and again, this is uh, this neglects uh, algorithmic overheads, but we'll take those into account in a later slide. 
All right, now this is just a very brief summary of the other result on this advantage, even if you ignore the cost of energy. And uh, it's a very simple argument. It's just based on uh, considering a problem of simulating a 3D mesh of elements. So this could be a computational physics application where you need local communication uh, between processing elements. And uh, you find that if you just analyze uh, what's the minimum uh, density, what's, what's the maximum uh, density of the machine that you can have and still get the entropy that's produced by the computation out through the surface, uh, you find the irreversible machine requires a more spreading out of the processing elements to accommodate the greater entropy production. And the upshot of everything is that you get this polynomial scaling advantage. Uh, it's only the 1 36th power of the number of processing elements, but if you assume a little more communication is required, it improves to n to the 1 18th power. And if you can do reversible computing ballistically, that is using say some form of super adiabaticity, you can get the dissipation to be negligible even at finite speeds, then the uh, advantage here improves to uh, into the one ninth power, and that may um, that may sound small, but you know, suppose you have a meter cube packed with uh, ten to eighteen micron scale devices. Um, you know, that's uh, you know, even into the one ninth when n is ten to the eighteenth, that's still a factor of a hundred uh, performance boost. And and keep in mind that's the ignoring the cost of energy and is just paying attention to the communication constraints um, of the application, even for the locally connected problem. And, uh, and that, you know, it shows that um, there are problems for which reversible machine will beat all irreversible machines, regardless of architecture. Uh, so, and, and ignoring the cost of energy even. All right, so that is interesting. Um, Back to some more practical thing. Um, you know, we mentioned that some problems appear to require algorithmic overheads to do reversibly. And in reality, there's going to be some bounded limit on energy efficiency of our devices generally. There's going to be some leakage or other uh, characteristics that limit energy efficiency. But we can still show an advantage. Um, because we have these algorithms that can uh, reversibilize, uh, so to speak, an irreversible computation, we can apply those algorithms, uh, fine tune their parameters for the given uh, circumstances and uh, come up with the solution that minimizes total costs, including you know, manufacturing related costs and energy costs. Uh, and then as the low level character so the technology improves, like leakage uh, is reduced, uh, that's the x-axis here, um, then we can, uh, this is the on-off ratio technically, uh, then we get a greater and greater advantage. And there are overheads that also increase, but as long as the cost per device keeps decreasing, we can manage that. So if we want to uh, Im improve overall system cost efficiency by a factor of n, all we have to do is release, reduce leakage by this factor n to the about two and a half and reduce uh, the time amortized manufacturing cost by about n to the 1.6, then, um, then we get that factor of n, right? So if we want a thousand times boost in overall system cost efficiency, all you have to do is reduce leakage by this many millions of times, uh, reduce manufacturing cost per device by like 60,000 times and you're there and you just apply this general reversibilization algorithm. Uh, you run things adiabatically at the optimal speed and uh, you've got that advantage, right? As long as your problem uh, is parallelizable to the extent that uh, you can realize that. So that's a nice result and very motivating, I think. All right, so now very briefly, some discussion of reversible architectures and languages, um, and I'm almost out of time, so I'm not gonna spend much time on this. But uh, 
other speakers in the session will talk about this in more detail. Um, first, I, I want to say that, you know, we really, I think, need new hardware description languages or at least new features of existing languages and new support from uh, EDA tools uh, to really effectively design um, uh, reversible architectures at scale. And this is because most of the time when you're designing real reversible functional units, they're not unconditionally reversible. They're reversible given certain preconditions on the inputs and internal state. And it would be very nice if the tool could check those preconditions for us, either at compile time or, um, or at simulation time. And so, you know, this seems readily do doable. In fact, some of my students at UF uh, built a tool that will check uh, these conditions in a discrete simulation. Um, but we need, we need more sophisticated tools. And of course, for circuit synthesis, we need tools that are aware of these uh, economic considerations I was talking about and that optimize a design appropriately given information about the relative weight of energy costs and hardware costs for the uh, for the technology, the underlying technology you're targeting. So this is doable. Uh, there's also new work in algorithms for reversible sh machines, and this includes both hardware algorithms and higher level software algorithms. Um, and the reason for this is just because the best reversible algorithm for a given problem is not necessarily possible to uh, straightforwardly derive from the best uh, irreversible algorithm for, uh, for the problem, even when that's known. And so generally you have to do some redesign or um, you know, the algorithm needs to be newly tuned for the reversible case. Um, and there was an example in my dissertation, which was the all pair shortest path algorithm for which you can do pretty well with the Floyd Warshall algorithm on an irreversible machine, but on a reversible machine, uh, you actually can do better with an alternative algorithm. Uh, you get less overhead from making that reversible than uh, from using Floyd Warshall. Um, so, uh, but you know, even very basic things like, let's say you wanna do an in-bit adder design, you know, we don't really know yet the best reversible circuit architecture or logic architecture for that. Um, although there has been a fair bit of work on that, but you know, even for traditional irreversible Boolean logic, uh, lower bounds on circuit complexity are notorious, notoriously difficult to come by. So, you know, this shouldn't be surprising to us. Uh, very briefly, a little bit about uh, the history of uh, reversible architectures. Uh, you know, the earliest work on this stuff was in uh, Ed Fredkin's group at MIT. Uh, back in the late 70s, and uh, you know these papers are, are hard to find. Although I, I have some copies somewhere, but um, you know it's very interesting to see how many of the later ideas that appeared in this field were actually already invented uh, by these students uh, back in the late 70s. But uh, uh, I'm not going to talk in detail about most of these, but uh, just to review some of the things I was involved with. Um, uh, Carlin Vieri had an instruction set called uh, Pen for an architecture called Pendulum uh, that he did his master's on in 95. And then I uh, made some improvements to that and uh, implemented a, an irreversible implementation of it called TIC in 96. And then uh, went on to design a processor not based on Pendulum, but just a simple cell on a model of computation. Um, so this could be considered as effectively an FPGA called flat top for simulating the billiard ball model uh, of Fredkin. And uh, so we implemented that and then uh, Vieira for his PhD thesis to implement uh, the full pendulum architecture, including um, the uh, improvements I suggested. Um, and uh, he finished, uh, he graduated at the same time I did in 99. 
so that was some nice early work showing that there was nothing fundamentally impossible about doing reversible architectures. Uh, you know, some features of Pendulum, there were uh, various types of instructions. Um, some of them had no overhead to do reversibly. Some of them you do reversibly by XORing the result into a destination register and then leave it up to the programmer to manage the garbage data. And then we made uh, the control flow reversible with this concept of paired branches where uh, you branch to another branch instruction that is expecting to receive control uh, from the place you came from. And you can still do standard control flow constructs with the paired branches. And uh, so that all works out very nicely. And then in terms of high level languages, these are really also, you know, you can do reversible high, high level languages without too many departures from conventional high level languages. There are a few extra constraints like in my language, uh, R, or you might call it YAR if you write it out this way, if this is a Russian uh, Cyrillic YA character. Um, this, uh, you know, one condition was you shouldn't change the if condition within the body of the if because that's, we need that con constraint to make the paired branches work properly. And so there's a few changes like that, but other than that, it's semantics is mostly the same uh, as a fairly standard procedural high level language. And I did a demonstration that you could implement a complete simulation of the 1D Schrodinger wave equation uh, in a very concise block of R code or YAR code. And, uh, you know, I tested this and, you know, it produced the exact right results and you could reverse it exactly. And so that was all very nice. All right. So that was just some early work that was done in that area. So in conclusion, uh, you know, we have this basic rationale for reversible computing, which is that, you know, if you just assume that energy is a fundamental unit of cost or that there's a lower bound on the cost of energy, then uh, you cannot get overall economic improvements from conventional computing beyond a certain point. Uh, you have to move to reversible computing and uh, keep producing energy dissipation per operation. Um, and there, the scaling works out well. Um, so, you know, even using the device technologies we already have, um, performance per unit area scales up with the thickness for 3D machine architecture, scales up as the square root of the thickness, at least, uh, for 3D architectures. Um, and even if energy, if somehow it were to become free, uh, you'd still get a scaling advantage from reversible computing in applications that require communication between uh, processors. And uh, if you could invent a new device technology that would have uh, negligible dissipation at finite speeds, then you could do even better, of course. You get even bigger. Uh, wins for reversible computing than you can do with classic adiabatic scaling. And so I, I think it's inevitable that computing will eventually move to the reversible paradigm. And as we make things more and more reversible, that requirement will pervade things at all levels of computer design up th from the architecture, up through uh, the overall processor design and the design of high level <coughs> programming languages and algorithms. So anyway, that's it for today's talk and feel free to ask questions in the Q&A.